Hello, I'm Michael Finn, Holistic Exercise and Lifestyle Coach, and today we're going to talk about shin splints. And those people that either have them or have had them in the past probably don't want to talk about shin splints. But today we're going to talk about it to teach you how to recover from shin splints, if you already have them, and also how to strengthen everything up and prevent them from happening in the first place. So, because we don't really want them, they don't really feel very good. So, shin splints are basically when we have pain in the front of our shin, walking, running, jumping, and various other activities that are involving the legs and things like that. So, um, you'll basically know if you have them because they hurt in your shins. So, why they call them shin splints, I guess. But anyway, so what's basically happening is when we walk, run, jump, and other things like that, there's anywhere between two and eight times our body weight going through each leg. So if I just jump up on the ground and land like that, that's about four times my body weight going through my legs when I land back on the ground. And your body needs to dissipate that load, and the way that it does that is through the spring mechanisms or the fascia in our muscles in our lower legs and our upper legs and the rest of our body, but the lower leg takes the biggest hit because it's closest to the ground. So the muscles need to be really strong to handle that kind of load. And so when you actually have shin splints, what's happening is you've had microfibril tears get in between the bone and the muscle itself. So the, the anterior tibialis is attached onto the shin bone or the tibia and the microfibril tears are starting to rip that anterior tibialis basically right off of the tibia itself. So, and so you get all sorts of swelling and inflammation. So the first thing you need to do to try to work on recovery is by icing that area, and I recommend that you do ice massage. So I'm going to pretend that this lacrosse ball is actually a piece of ice. So what you want to do is you want to get a big chunk of ice and you want to put it on the shin and you want to do circles on the sore areas of your shin so that you're not only massaging the area but you're also making the area cold. So, and when we use ice, ice uses the same pathways to the brain to tell your brain that it's cold as your body uses the pathways to tell your body that there's pain. And so when you have pain, if we put ice on it, the primary thing it does is it fills up that pathway with cold, and so then all your brain can experience is cold, and then it can't feel the pain anymore. So if we just do some ice massage, and then the massage itself of doing little circles is going to actually increase the circulation and stimulate the immune system to come and heal up all of that tissue so that you can be healthier and that you won't have the pain and you won't have the shin splints anymore. All right, so that's how the first step of trying to uh, eliminate the problem. Second thing you need to look at is how tight are your calf muscles. So if I sit here with my leg up on, hanging off the end of this step, and I pull my toes up towards me, I should be able to get a pretty good angle. I should be getting about 10 degrees here at the ankle as I pull my toes up towards me so that it shows that I've got you know, a fairly decent amount of range of motion at the calf. And if I bend my leg a little bit, then I need to be able to do the same thing to where I get you know, about 10 degrees of flexion here between the tibia. And you'll see that I actually have more here because my big gastric nemius muscle is tighter than the little soleus muscle. So, um, but that's just because I'm into sprinting and so my legs are used to hitting the ground when they're bent and I play a lot of sports and all sorts of things and I work on these things a lot. Okay, so if those are tight, then we need to stretch the calf muscles. Whether you do it by putting your hands up on a wall and putting one foot back and trying to bring your hips forward while you're keeping that heel on the ground or that foot that's back and then the other foot can be in front to help stabilize a little bit. So whether you do a calf stretch that way, you know, that's fine. Lots of people know this one. Whether you put your toes up on a curb in front of you with your heel still on the ground and then take your leg forward and you get a stretch that way. Or whether you come all the way up onto a step and 
have your toes up on the step and hang your heel down and, and try to sink into the stretch this way. So all those ways are different ways of stretching the calf muscles. If you do a search on here about strengthening the feet, uh, on, on my, here on my YouTube channel, if you do a uh, search for strengthening your feet, that will bring up a couple of different videos that I go through all of those exercises for strengthening your feet um, in great detail so, um, so that you get that. So other parts are we need to try to strengthen that anterior tibialis. Okay, So this is part of both the aspect of recovering now and preventing future occurrences. So we're going to do what's called an anterior tibialis tib lift. So this exercise has become popular again. I've been doing it for over 30 years. But Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy, has made this popular once again and people know about it. So we want to be standing up against a wall with our feet about a foot and a half to two feet in front of us, somewhere around in that ballpark. If you got shorter legs, you're going to be a little closer to the wall. If you got longer legs like me, you're going to be farther away from the wall. So with the feet straight out in front of you, have your weight in your heels, and I want you to try to pick your toes up and the balls of your feet up off of the floor as high as you can so that just the back of your heels are touching the floor, and then lower all the way back down. Picking them all the way up, and then lower all the way down. So best if you do this like when you're barefoot. Make sure there's some cushioning underneath your heels because it might be a little bit tough for you. I got a yoga mat down underneath my heels. But just stand there and just try to lift those toes up as high as you possibly can. Get the ball of foot as high off the ground you can. And then lower back down. So um, you can also do it on one foot. You can also do the same thing on one foot. It's a little bit more difficult. It takes a little bit more work. So, But you can also do the same thing on one foot. Um, and lift those toes up. You can also do walking around on your heels, keeping the balls of the feet up off of the ground and just walking around on your heels. You can go forward, backward, sideways, all sorts of other things. And all these little accessory exercises that you could do between your big heavy mover exercises in the gym. You could do a set of squats and then you could walk around on your heels a little bit. You could do a set of bench press and then you could do some anterior tib lift over there a little bit. This is how I fit all these little accessory exercises into my workout routine. I'm never actually really resting. I'm just doing little accessory exercises that aren't hard. It's just developing the small muscles that are uh, improving the function of my body. So, all right. So that's the first way we can do it. There's lots of other different ways to work the tibialis. You can find other things like that here in my programs too. Um, but then we also need to develop strength. So remember how I said when we march, run, jump, or anything like that, there's lots of load going down, anywhere between two and eight times your body weight, depending upon what we're doing. Even Usain Bolt was doing five times his body weight when he was sprinting at max speed to break the 100 meter record. So there's tremendous amounts of load and we need to condition the tissue to handle that. So in my speed and strength programs, you will find jumping programs that I have in there that where we start with little jumps. So say like if you're just going to pretend like you got a jump rope and you're just going to bounce on the balls of your feet and do a little jumping in place, you know, you can do that like 25 times, 25 little jumps once a day, once every other day and develop that anterior tibialis to handle that. So the other thing you can do is you can do uh, changing of direction jumping. So you might do eight jumps in place and then eight jumps forward and backward, just small, I'm barely even going a few inches, but it just changes the load into that anterior tibialis. And then eight jumps side to side, and then eight jumps with a quarter turn going back and forth, rotating your whole body. So, and doing eight of those. And all of that, once again, is in my strength and speed programs to develop the lower leg so that we can push more into the ground without causing pain, okay? So, starting off small. So, I might do like eight of each of those with somebody. Then the next week I'll do 10. The week after that I'll do 12. And so on and so on. And I'll build all the way up to where they're doing 25 of each of those. So that it ends up being 25, 50, 75, 
like a hundred jumps. Okay. So then, then they're used to doing like a hundred jumps without a problem at a small, low little level. Then I'm going to increase the intensity, um, even more, but I will start really small again where I'll have them do like pogo jumps where we really jump as high as we can and spring off of those feet and we jump up there a whole lot and we'll do just six or eight of those. Um, and then each day we might change the direction we go. So Mondays we might just go straight up and down. and Tuesdays we might go laterally and Wednesdays we might put the rotation in there. Things like that. But we're only going to do eight of them because they're much more explosive and you're going to put tremendous amounts of load in through your feet and that way you can develop that anterior tibialis. These are all things you can do in your own living room. You don't have to be at the gym, you don't have to be out of practice, and they need to be done like all year round so that when we get away, so like right now, one of the reasons why I'm doing this video is because I got lots of people calling me because it's track season that their lower legs are hurting. And that is because we need to condition it in the fall and in the winter so that when we start training in the spring really hard, everything's already can handle what you're going to subject it to. So in the fall and in the winter time, I'm doing all these little jumps all over the place. And then also once you get good, once you can do all the big jumps and everything on two feet, then we go back to the little ones and we go on one foot. And we practice them on one foot so that now you've got even more load because now it's just going through one leg and develop everything up. So it's all a matter of progression. These things are all in my strength and speed programs. So if you're interested, go to finfit.com. That's F-I-N-N-F-I-T.com. And you can check out my speed and strength programs. Reach out to me, ask questions. You can always shoot me an email and say, hey, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. What's the next progression I can do to improve something? All right. So I hope that helps. Uh, look for my other videos on strengthening feet and look for my other videos on my speed and strength program. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the next video. Have a happy and healthy day.